I think most parents want to be great parents, but there's a body of knowledge about how best to promote a child's healthy growth and development, and those little ones don't come with a set of instructions when they're born. Children who live in resource families are children whose parents have access to time, uh, to education, to information, to extended family. Um, they have the resources to learn how best to promote their child's early learning. And families who are under a great deal of stress due to poverty and other risk factors, they don't always have the connections to the information. They often are socially isolated. They don't have the social capital to call upon. And they simply aren't aware of what they ought to be doing uh, to promote their child's early learning, their early development. Forty percent of our children in Nebraska are at risk of not succeeding in school. At risk means that there are income issues in the family, language issues, difficulty at birth, and or family uh, parents not getting a very high level of education. Those all place a child at risk for not having a good school experience or maybe even not completing school. This is a big deal. Dog. If you ask a room full of kindergarten teachers how soon they know which children are going to be in trouble, they'll tell you they can tell you the answer to that question in the first day. And they know primarily because of two reasons, because of the language skills of the children and because of their behavior. And what happens when children start a year behind, that's like sending your three or four year old to kindergarten and expecting them to be successful. They're just not there yet. And when a teacher has to try and adjust for children and make up that time, it's very difficult. Last year in Scotts Bluff Public Schools, 59% of the children entered that school were at risk. And at risk simply means they don't have the, uh, the ability uh, to be able to communicate, they don't have the ability to speak the language, they don't have the, the basic skills to be successful even in kindergarten. So you have the school um, starting these children already behind. And what to me is a real tragedy, now we evaluate our teachers on this basis that, hey, we're going to give you this assessment of these children. These children aren't doing well. You're failing as a teacher. It really isn't the truth. The real issue is here the child started behind. It's quite amazing to see how things have changed over the last 30, 40, 50 years in the field of early childhood development. Up until the 1960s, hardly anyone spent much time academically thinking about young children. And there wasn't a sense of urgency there wasn't an understanding that if we did not act quickly on behalf of very young children, especially children growing up in poverty, that those children might suffer for the rest of their lives as a result of this. But that's all changed over these decades. Head Start was a critical development that has led a lot of people to be interested, not only in early childhood education, but in the education of children living in poverty, because that's the principal uh, target for Head Start programs. But we have a great deal of research, and uh, we've learned about the uh, capacities of, of very young children, and we've learned a lot about what we can do for children even in the first three years of life, which previously we didn't know. Another major change that's taken place over the last 30, 40 years uh, is the entry of women into the workforce in large and larger numbers. So that now we don't have uh, any place for children to be taken care of if they aren't in some form of uh, organized care um, because there isn't a parent at home anymore and there is no choice for many families economically. So many children are with their parents at home, but many children are in childcare programs. 
And then right around age three, you start hearing the word preschool, and children are in preschool programs, either run by the school or run by private entities in the community. And they can be half-day programs or they can be six-hour-day programs. And sometimes those preschools then add before and after schools for working parents. By the time the children are um, age five, then they start kindergarten and then go into the formal education system. I see as one of the principal challenges facing us here in Nebraska and throughout the United States what we call the achievement gap, the disparity between achievement of, of children living in poverty uh, and those who are more advantaged. One of the most powerful illustrations of how this disparity starts so early is a great language study where they had three groups of families. Uh, one was a set of families that were on public assistance, another were middle class families, and the third were uh, parents who were professionals or uh, had higher incomes. And they put recorders on all their children so that they could record the number of words that children were hearing in their home. And by 18 months, the children from resource families were hearing five to seven times more words than the kids in the low-income families. And they had vocabularies that were two to three times greater by 18 months. And that gap just kept getting wider so that by kindergarten, when the children start school, um, the children from low-income families um, have vocabularies that are one-third the size of the children from resource families. Estimates run as high as 30 million words heard by a three-year-old living in the home of professional parents as contrasted to 10 million words heard by a three-year-old living in a family of poverty. That's a three to one difference. Now you ask yourself, why is that so important? It's important because acquisition of vocabulary is very highly connected, highly related to ability to learn to read by third grade. We know from the science that if children have strong beginnings in the first five years, they're gonna start kindergarten in great shape and they're gonna still be in great shape in third grade, fifth grade, and high school. The evidence is quite clear that if we begin early, if we begin well, and if we are persistent in our efforts, the likelihood is great that we can reduce or eliminate this gap in achievement. High quality. Early childhood education brings children who are considered at risk of not having a good school experience to a level where they have much better odds. They have higher education attainments in terms of college. They tend to not be involved in the criminal justice system. They tend to not have to repeat grades. They actually marry. <laughs> at a higher rate, which means they're having families and becoming community members. Um, all of these things are, are great news for us as citizens to know that this kind of investment yields this kind of result for us as a community. What we learn, what children learn in the first few years of life have, has a tremendous impact later on in their lives so that these children call upon uh, society for less. They're able to give back to society so that these uh, children are not wards of the state, these children are not in trouble with the law, but these children are tax-paying citizens who uh, are contributing tremendously to our society. And a lot of that comes from what happens in the early years of life. We have different approaches to early childhood education depending on who we're talking to. 
Middle class families tend to go to Parents' Day Out, and then they have other supports in their lives that wrap around and provide care for their child, relatives, neighbors, friends. Um, so they only need that little part-time amount of care. At Educare, we're serving families that are both low income and seeking to go to school and work and may be lacking strong family support. These families are going to be the ones that are likely to lose that job or lose that opportunity for school if they don't get a low cost, affordable childcare and education. The um, opportunities for, for infants and toddlers are, are very few because it is so very expensive to provide infant and toddler care. The ratio of adult to infant or toddler is very high, so you have to have more adults to, to care for fewer children than you do for preschool age children. And that just in and of itself is, a, is cost prohibitive. And so oftentimes programs that provide high quality programming might not have as many slots available for infants and toddlers. Um, they might have to limit the amount of slots that they have available for um, families that are on subsidy or might need additional assistance. Any good school's responsibility is to meet the needs of its community, and that's changed quite a bit. In the 90s, we didn't even have all-day kindergarten. We didn't provide any breakfast programs. As the need has increased to kind of um, help those kids be ready to learn and then also graduate on time, we've added a tremendous number of programs. Almost all of our preschool children would be of minority status because our programs first were built on the most needy, the most at risk. So we set up a criteria. Do you speak English? What's your poverty level? At the beginning of each year, I'd say on average, about 5% of our kids speak English well, and that's their first language, and about 95% in Spanish is their first language. We wanted to bring those kids up who didn't have the advantages prior to school so that they could start on a level playing field at kindergarten. Franklin is uh, a Title I school. Uh, we have close to 100% of our students on free and reduced lunch. We have about 270 students, uh, grades ranging from Head Start through sixth grade. Well, well, school is different from daycare. Daycare is a business. It's a business, you know, and I, and I respect that. You know, they they take great care of your child. You can go to work or go about your day, and if you find the right daycare that your child likes, then you can feel comfortable. But we have the choice to either have my daughter go um, to daycare all day as a four-year-old, or we have the option to have her come to a, a elementary school and, and do the Head Start program. And I felt as though it was better because it prepared better for when she does step in, into kindergarten. In Lexington, our early childhood uh, program goes uh, from birth through age five. What we have here in the Early Learning Academy is our center-based program for three and four-year-olds, and our birth through three program are for children who are home-based. Uh, our home visitors visit their home and actually work with them and the parents in the home. Most of our families qualify for free and reduced lunch, so they do have the low socioeconomic level. More than half of our students are English language learners. Many of the children come from families with a pretty high rate of illiteracy, and they have no experience with books. They've never been read stories. They don't have a wide variety of rich experiences. And so when they come here, their, their concepts, their experiences are, are pretty limited. The Buffett Early Childhood Fund is focused on creating opportunities for all children, especially the most vulnerable children, to have access to high quality birth to five experiences. So our practice investments are with the Educare schools. Those are high quality birth to five programs that are offered to the most at risk children and their families. Educare is meant to be a model of how the very best programs can look 
uh, who are programs that are focused on children in the first five years of life. In EDUCARE programs, we have remarkable physical facilities, and we have very, very good teachers who get a lot of support and a lot of connection between the, the teachers and uh, the parents uh, whose children are in the classrooms. What we also see in EDUCARE programs um, are a very good ratio of number of teachers to number of children. This place is not a daycare. It's, I can call it an educational palace. This place offers education early starthood program for our kids. And the other obvious reason is this place offers help for people in need because of the low income. In a good childcare, a high quality childcare program, we want to see books, we want to see materials, we want to see things that are available and that are age appropriate for children, and we want to see interaction between the adults and the child. We want to see uh, adults who are trying to extend what children are trying to learn, who, who help them take the next step. And, uh, and provide for them. We want to see art, we want to see blocks, we want to see fantasy play. Um, that's not so easy to find all the time. Those things I've just described are the stuff of early childhood. That's what kids learn from, and that's what will help them to learn the next things that are along in their lives. When my daughter was four, I decided to bring her to to learn Early Learning Academy because she's very shy. And so I needed her to be around kids and see how the whole school was. We emphasize literacy and language, but we also have objectives in uh, math, science, social studies, art. So when the children are playing and involved in the things that we have planned for them to do, they use everything. That's that's the most powerful learning that there is when you're totally involved. This year, she's opened up to the teacher. She's hugged them. She actually has friends. She's speaking a lot of English because that was another of our goals that she would be introduced into the English language because at home we mainly speak to her in Spanish. I mean, it's been amazingly, her growth is just out there. We work on school skills, like sitting quietly, listening to your teacher, raising your hand. Um, we do some calendar time where the kids are working on counting. We have language for learning, which I do with our English speakers. And then my paraeducator helps me do the Espanol to English program for our children who don't have a lot of English skills. We really are working um, more on some of those academic skills and we're getting them prepared for kindergarten. At semester time of kindergarten, we give a reading test called Dibbles. It provides for us where we'd like kids to be on a certain benchmark with their language abilities slash reading. We had our most at-risk kids, poverty, not speaking English, in our preschools score higher than their more affluent peers. Whatever we were doing got us exactly where we wanted to be. One of the biggest misconceptions about early childhood education is that it isn't education, perhaps. That it's not delivering learning and development from birth on. When we work with our babies here, we're very conscious that what those babies are putting in place is a trust in the world. If they trust in the world, then they'll explore that world. Our curriculum has lots of teachers talking all day, every day, explaining, you know, I'm sitting in a chair right now and um, telling what we're doing and encouraging the children to also say what they're doing as they're doing it. We read and read and read and it's really exciting when our kids are able to retell the stories that we're reading and that they're so engaged that they are storytellers themselves too. We know that we can't change this child's life trajectory by a six, eight, even 10 hour program every day if we don't also affect 
the interactions between the parents and their children because that fundamentally is the most important relationship. If you know how important it is to talk with your children from infancy on, and if you know and understand how important it is to respond to their cues, that you're setting them up for communication when you do that, that every time you go up and down the stairs, you're counting the steps together, you're providing the foundation for understanding math once they get to school. So it's this richness of experiences from day one that make it possible for children to be fully capable of taking advantage of what the school has to offer to them once they get to kindergarten. The most promising approaches are ones that involve parents directly, of course, in the first three years of life. Home visiting, for example. One of the most exciting parts, I think, of the program that we provide is that we have home visitors who go in and they work with the parents. They teach the parents how to read books to their children. And if the parents aren't able to read, they teach them how to read the pictures. Um, they also need to convince these families that it's not just the school's job to educate the children, that the parents are probably one of the most critical factors. And that is the part that we really work on, is the parent involvement in a child's education. That's, that is the thing that's going to mean success for those children. On a home visit, we typically Depending on the child's needs and where that family is, we show parents how to interact with their babies appropriately. The parents are the primary teachers. I model the activity and then parents interact one-on-one -on -one with their babies. They come and they help teach my son and I how to do fun activities that will help him learn as long as with me learn how to handle certain situations and what things I should let him play with and what things I shouldn't let him play with and if he's reaching his developmental milestones and cover things that the doctor doesn't really cover. It's just easier to do with somebody in an in-home environment. It's easier and more relaxed. Well, we have a role here that's called the Family Engagement Specialist and Educare has that as a defined role. They have a a group of parents that they work with and they reach out to, they meet with them in their home, they meet with them here at the school, they try to know what's going on in their life so they can, when they see them in the hallway, they say, how did that go? How did your job interview go? Are you able to keep that electricity on after all or should we meet and find a resource? They understand our situation and they provide help in the most perfect way. They know that Sometimes being in need requires sensitivity in your treatment and they are providing glimpse of hope, of hope to, for us to stand on our feet and be active and one day we will provide the same help. Parents who are struggling economically are just as committed to their children's well-being and development as our parents who are not. What they face is a different life world. Trying to catch a bus that takes an hour to get to them and get them to work, and then to go get their child on time from childcare so they can get home in time to fix some meal when they have stretched budget to even figure out what ingredients should go in that meal. But if you're struggling to make ends meet, pay the rent, get food on the table, pay the bills, that can consume people and education while they don't mean it to take maybe a second seat to these other things. The reality is that those things, you know, do just take their toll on people's energy um, and so on. It makes it difficult for them and honestly it does. Just because I know that we are low income but we're not low functioning, I guess you would say. Um, our income puts us in this neighborhood, not our love for our children's education. The biggest influence that your child has is you. And if you're promoting education and you're on them about school and you sit down and you do homework and you're doing letters and numbers and you're reading books, that, 
that's going to show them that education is important. Well, I think one thing to remember is that there have always been economically struggling people. Uh, we haven't always thought that it, that it was worth it to worry about their children. And what we figured out is that we can't afford to ignore any of our children. It, not only do we lose incredible potential for our own development as a nation and, and in, our, in our own local communities, but we will face costs. We will face costs that are just a waste of money. To pour money into a criminal justice system, a criminal justice system with the highest incarceration rate in Western countries, is a tremendous waste of capital and resource that we could be investing in our infrastructure, in our innovations. Uh, if people truly understood the results of early childhood development and looked at the statistics and the data, how could you deny it? I mean, how could you turn your back on those children and realize that if you don't have those programs available, we are programming this child to fail. And I object to that. I think it's wrong. And I think we need to step in and address those particular issues. One of the saddest things I've ever heard is somebody who's older and has grown children saying, I don't think I need to help out with education anymore. Education is always going to be this river flowing through our civic life that is nourishing absolutely everything that grows around us. If we don't take care of today's children, tomorrow's adults are not going to take care of our community, our country, and our planet. I would ask everybody to say, what would you want for your child? And what you want for your child should be there for every child. If we are going to have a vibrant, successful community and state. I believe there's a tremendous urgency to what we're doing with children. Today, there are children being born and tomorrow, they're growing older and the next day, a day older than that. And if we say, well, we're going to get to this, um, this is something down the road, this is something we'll do within five years, we're too late for that child. And that doesn't feel right to me. If children grow up loved and cared for with endless opportunities to explore and learn and create, then we create a better path for all of us. It's, it's suddenly a new world. The newest human beings on the planet are here and we get to learn together. What might be next? What might be better? What might be something I never thought of? You're gonna think of it, aren't you?